Well, good morning. Uh, you have actually, <coughs> to wrap up this sermon series, not one mic, but two mics. Um, as you know, Michael means godlike. Uh, and so this morning, uh, I'll wrap up the morning series. And this evening, Mr. Darbandi will wrap up the evening series. But don't panic, because we also have a, a lot of other Jesus and God radiant preachers in the preaching team that you'll see on other occasions. So <coughs> the sermon title is Stories to Tell. The one that uh, each of us will look at, I'll look at it this morning, is The Hidden Lamp, uh, a story that Jesus tells on four different occasions. And uh, here are the words that we'll be reflecting on for the next half hour in Matthew's version. Uh, this comes in the Sermon on the Mount, which Gareth was telling us about when he preached last week. <coughs> and here... Uh, Three verses, can I make three verses last for a whole sermon? Oh, yes, I can. Um, <laughs> Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, you, talking to his followers, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, if you're in auto mode for sermon listening, that may not have scared you too much. But just look again at what Jesus is saying. Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This is uh, pretty darn scary stuff. <coughs> Martin Lloyd-Jones says... This is one of the most astounding and extraordinary statements about the Christian that was ever made. Um, what I want to <coughs> try and help you with this morning is, is focus in on, on what we're being encouraged towards. And let me say at the outset, I don't believe Jesus is simply saying you must try harder. Uh, I don't believe, though you can discuss this with me over coffee, Jesus is saying all of you must live better lives than those around you. That you might find a little bit more difficult. But let me say this, if you think that you are living a better life than those around you, you could be stepping onto some fairly dangerous territory. Uh, and we'll unpack that as we go. So here is the master plan. Uh, the first thing is the picture that Jesus uses, trying to explain and understand that. The second thing is there are some interesting questions. For me, my, my life's work has been around trying to understand and communicate the Bible. We'll look at the issues that arise there. Then I want to try and focus in on Jesus' uh, plan and purpose in all of this. And lastly, because I am, I hope, a practical preacher, uh, think about what we can do in order that our uh, light, or be more precise, the light of Jesus, might shine more for those who are around us. Now, Jesus, as you will be aware, frequently uses everyday pictures to bring his teaching to life. Uh, so uh, you read about flowers and foxes and fields and thieves and livestock and family relationships, unexpected guests turning up, uh, buildings and their weaknesses, weddings and goodness knows what else. And the picture that we're considering uh, this morning and again this evening uh, is one that Jesus uses actually on four different occasions. Um, it's in Mark's Gospel, it's in Luke's Gospel twice, and it's in Matthew's Gospel. And uh, if you want to uh, go away and check the Greek of the different accounts, then you will find, as I have found, that there are some interesting differences and similarities that tell us what I suppose we'd know by common sense anyway, that this was a picture that Jesus liked to use and used again and again. You may have noticed in our preaching team that some of us use our illustrations more than once, and Jesus was the same. This was something he liked to refer to. So this is my picture of um, the uh, Mount of Beatitudes. I strongly suspect Gareth took his from a library. This was one that I took myself. I could... <laughs> Just mention in passing that my next tour is now set up for Israel and Palestine in Easter. Uh, other tours are available. So Jesus, on the top of this mountain, overlooking Capernaum, which is his hometown, uh, says to the people who are gathered around him, you, you are the light of the world. And he compares it to uh, a city on a mountaintop. I couldn't find a photograph of Jerusalem in the first century, uh, but this is Jerusalem today. And of course, when Jesus talks about a city on a mountaintop, everybody would think straight away of Jerusalem, which is built up there on Mount Zion. Uh, 
So he's saying it's, it, you just can't hide something like that, and you shouldn't try to. And then he takes this ordinary, everyday picture of lighting in a home. Uh, this is Capernaum, which was Jesus' uh, hometown. And uh, you can see there first century homes that they have excavated. I, I just love this stuff. And uh, if you focus in, you can find that each individual home, if we highlight it there, has a, a small area, I guess from me to that pillar, is the sort of living area for a family. And the wonderful people at a ministry uh, called Nazareth Village have recreated things from the time of Jesus, uh, homes, a small synagogue, um, <coughs> a carpenter's workshop where a nice man called Joseph works, uh, a, a place where there's wool dyeing and so on. So this is their everyday type home <laughs> from the time of Jesus. And sort of, uh, wrong way. Uh, over on the shelf there is the light. Uh, notice that Jesus talks about one light which lights up the whole home. And the scholars tell us that this is the way it is. They had a small home. They didn't have, as we might have, our sophisticated lighting systems to make that place look different from different places. Um, one light to light the house. Now, excuse me for being a pretentious old git, but I have to do what I do really well. Um, it so happens that I, I had at home a genuine first century oil lamp from the time of Jesus. Um, so I had a very happy time earlier this week um, cleaning it out, and on Thursday I, I lit it for the first time for 2,000 years. And uh, so what we need to do <coughs> is to take our first century oil lamp. Now, I, I wanted to be able to show you a first century uh, oil jug. Sadly, I only have a three and a half thousand year old oil jug, roughly from the time of the judges. But you get your oil jug and you pop in a little soupçon of olive oil, and then you can light your oil lamp. There are fire extinguishers there, there, <laughs> and there. So it's a, this is a 21st century match, yes. Yeah. Oh, come on, referee. There we are. So there you have your oil lamp, which is functioning and working. Uh, I'm not sure if I can trust it for 25 minutes. Now, here we have another artifact. This is not a first century jug. This is a preaching fee from Uganda. But it's about two gallons, so it's about right for, for the number of bushels concerned. And here is the perfectly simple illustration that Jesus uses. In Matthew, he says, you don't take your grain measure, one day's grain, and put it over the light. Some scientific commentators talk about the absence of oxygen. And so it's basically, it's putting a light where it's not going to work. Um, and in other passages, Jesus talks about putting your light under the bed, which is similarly daft. So that's the <laughs> picture that we're looking at. Um, let's think about how Jesus says this and uses it. Uh, like many things, uh, most of us don't know our Bibles as well as we would like to. But people in the time of Jesus did know their Bibles quite well. So when the phrase, the light of the world, was used, they would know that in their scriptures, which we call the Old Testament, God, Adam, Israel, the Torah, the Jewish law, the temple, and Jerusalem are all called the light of the world before Jesus comes on the scene. And then Jesus comes, and in John's Gospel, Jesus describes himself as the light of the world. So we're talking about playing with the big boys here. You know, this is a, a big, big statement for Jesus to make about himself. But then, oh dear, perhaps I should take it back. All right. um, yeah, now Jesus describes his followers with the same term. And uh, before we finish this morning, we're going to have to deal with our, uh, many of us, Maybe one or two here who are perfect, and we'll cancel you later. But for most of us, when we think about whether our deeds are good enough to bring people to faith, we're going to feel a little bit inadequate. So be encouraged. When Jesus uses this term, uh, you picture him uh, giving the Sermon on the Mount, on the Mount of Beatitudes. Immediately around him is closer followers, and then the wider gathering of those around. And he calls them, describes them factually, not aspirationally, as the light of the world. 
despite their weaknesses and vulnerabilities. So let's do a quick review of the people who are immediately gathered around him, that Jesus says, you are the light of the world. These are ordinary guys, uh, non-professionals, no higher education, no religious training. Uh, amongst this group of 12, there is one corrupt public servant, one extreme outright agitator, one impulsive risk taker, uh, a political activist, two grumpy power seekers, a confirmed skeptic, and a disloyal traitor. <laughs> okay. So we got it good here, haven't we, Gareth? You know, um, and Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And as we try to understand what God wants to impart to us by his spirit from this scripture, we, we need to really get our heads seriously around this. Because most of us have been conditioned for much of our Christian life to think, must try harder, must do better, must do more good. Countless thousands are going to a Christless eternity simply because you said something naughty this morning. Um, so uh, what Jesus says is a fact, not an aspiration. And what he says to them, he says to you and he says to me, uh, if we are followers of Jesus, you are the light of the world. Not try to pump your flame up, yeah? Not try harder. You are the light of the world. However, there, you get an amateur theologian, there are going to be some, some questions. There, there are some questions that come into mind from this passage. And, and the first is, interestingly, Gareth, reading earlier uh, with a pattern of prayer, um, reminded us Jesus forbids ostentatious piety, making a show of the quality of your religious beliefs. So what are we going to do? On the one hand, Jesus is saying, let people see your good, word, your good works. And on the other hand, Jesus is saying, when you're going to do your spiritual duties, go into a private room and lock the door behind you. Jesus condemns the Pharisees as whitewashed tombs. Now, he doesn't tell them off for doing good things. He says, all of these rules that you're following, these you should follow. But he talks about actions that are produced for self-gratification rather than for the glory of God. That's going to get us on the right track. And we are all too aware of Christians' weaknesses. Uh, I've been a pastor for nearly 40 years. I know about people's weaknesses. Um, I know about pastors' weaknesses. I was talking with a, a pastor friend a few weeks ago uh, when I was starting to do my thinking about this pre I was saying, the trouble is, you know, Christians mess up all the time. And my friend said to me, and so do we who are leaders. Some get caught, some don't. But, but we mess up. To be human is to mess up. So back to what may or may not have been your reaction when I forced you to consider this verse of Scripture. There's an, an intriguing and wonderful thing called imposter syndrome, which was first written up by a psychology professor in the States called Pauline Rose Clance. And what she said was this, that particularly amongst the group that she was researching, who were um, highly placed professional women, an extraordinarily large proportion went through their life thinking, in my heart of hearts, I know I can't do this. One day, they'll find out, and I'll be out of a job. I feel like an imposter in this job. Uh, it might not surprise you to hear that more women than men feel this. Can't imagine why. Um, but the research has continued, and in 2017, um, a career development agency called Amazing If um, did their own research into this, and uh, they said that amongst millennials, a majority, uh, sorry, a third of millennials feel this, this same thing, this imposter syndrome. In a society where we are expected to be promoting and illustrating how good we are at our jobs, uh, those of us under the 30-year-old mark or whatever uh, are very highly likely to feel this. Um, and on top of that, I observe over the years that Jesus' followers grow 
a very high level of self-criticism. And when we do something that is wrong, that is visible, our reaction often, well, tell me if it's only me, but our reaction often is, but, but what if people have seen this? Um, uh, the other day, confession time. Don't worry, I'm not going to confess anything really embarrassed. I'd keep that quiet. But the other day, I was uh, uh, faffing around in the kitchen and being clumsy, dropped something. And I said not one word, but a number of words that Baptist ministers are, are not meant to use. I, actually, I always feel a bit embarrassed when I swear because I'm not very fluent in it. You know, some... <laughs> some so, some people have had a lot more practice than me. But anyway, you know, out came this little stream of, of words that Baptist ministers are taught not to say. And um, my first reaction, my second reaction was to apologize to God. My first reaction was, did my neighbor hear? Because the kitchen door's open. <laughs> because we have this fear that people are always watching our lives. And the moment we step out of line... Somebody's going to say, well, if that's a Christian, I don't want to be one. And it is a truth that people say, if not necessarily about a one-off lapse into swearing, but, but because of Christians they have met, Christians who have hurt them or who have betrayed them or who have let them down, um, people around us do watch and we're aware of it. But there's something else, and... Uh, um, I hope this is going to be like a helpful prodding for you to evaluate who you are and where you're going for Jesus. And this is that um, uh, I thought, why not look at some of the sociological research that tells us how much better Christian people live their lives than those who are not Christians. It's not there. Uh, those who claim to be religious seem, as far as the sociologists can say, measuring simple acts of goodness. Now, there is some good stuff we're going to come to. Don't panic yet. Don't, don't walk out. There's some good stuff coming. There's a, a wonderful sociologist called Alfie Cohn who wrote a book called The Brighter Side of Human Nature, which I've been foraging through. And uh, there are different examples he gives and some others that I've tracked to uh, help us to understand. For example, do Christians volunteer more than others? According to the Department for Communities and Local Government in a citizenship survey in 2011, no. According to the National Council of Voluntary Organizations doing a survey of faith and voluntary action in 2007, no. What about financial giving? Do religious people give more than those who are not? The simple answer is Yes, they do give a little bit more, uh, around 70% compared to around 60%. But as the National Humanist Association pointed out, most of that goes to churches. So if you think about charitable giving, which is not directly to a church that you are part of, uh, giving is comparable. And then there's a lovely piece of research I came across. What about comparable acts of kindness? Now, to do this one, which was a few years ago, they brought a sample of people in, some of whom were Christians and some of whom weren't. They asked them a whole load of questions, including questions designed to find out if they considered themselves Christian or not. One of them was, do you think that the Bible is from God? So they knew from the people who'd been into the interviews who counted themselves as Christians and who didn't. What the people who came didn't know was that they had employed an actor outside the interview room, and each time somebody went in and did the survey, as they came out, the actor fell off a ladder. And uh, what they were doing, the real purpose of the research, was to measure how many people from faith groups or non-faith groups would come and help the guy who fell off the ladder. And I have to tell you, according to the research, no great comparison and yet, yeah? so at the heart of what I'm trying to say is this. Your target is not to increase your number of good deeds. Think about it. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, let your light shine. And that's what we're going to up in a moment or, open up in a moment or two.
And yet, followers of Jesus have instituted some of the astonishing reforms of society in relation to slavery, in relation to women's rights, in relation to education, in relation to uh, health provision. Followers of Jesus are they way up at the front. Here's a positive thing to put against Richard Dawkins. Secular regimes kill more than religious regimes, it does need to be said. And people still say, I wish I had what you have. Tomorrow I'm going to a barbecue. It's the youth group from the church that I started out out at from in South London, in Carshalton Beaches, uh, which I started going to in 1968 as resident atheist. And... um, It took four and a half years for me to make the decision to follow Jesus. Uh, We used to meet and talk about our aspirations and careers. Then we talked about our babies. Now we talk about our hospital appointments. But But we still meet together. And, And I remember the two things that drew me to faith in Jesus were, on the one hand, Jesus. The more I encountered him, the more impressed I was. But on the other hand, these were people who had something I wanted. And this goes on and carries on. That was number two. Number three, the purpose. What is Jesus trying to say to this? Um, Now, Jesus does give rules about how to live. I love going to New Wine, running something there called Just Looking. And they come up with great things for me to do a talk on the next day. And uh, one of the new ones this year was, what are the rules a Christian has to follow? And my immediate reaction is, not too many. Love God, love your neighbor. Uh, I found over a hundred when I actually worked through the teaching of Jesus. So there are rules that Jesus uh, gives to us about how we're meant to live. But at the heart of what he teaches is this. What you are directs what you do. So immediately before in Matthew's gospel, this account of the light of the world, there's the stuff about you are the the salt of the earth. Um, So what you are affects what you do. Being those who in society are acting as preservative and taste enhancers affects what you do. So the purpose of a Christian, although actually this is what I was taught as a young follower of Jesus, is not to say, look at what I do and you will want to be a Christian. That invites people to look at what you do and say that they don't want to be a Christian. What the issue is, is whether or not we allow the reality of what God has made us and is making us to be visible to those who are around us. And when you (coughs) dig into the Greek text, as I like to, uh, the word that is used here, let your good deeds be seen, it's not good ethical, it's good beautiful. Uh, So your beautiful works, not your ethically superior works, but your beautiful works will cause people not to say how amazing you are, but to give praise to God. So Eugene Peterson translates the verse in this way. Keep open house, be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. So in terms of what you are directing what you do, what the follower of Jesus is saying to those around is, like everyone else, I know that I'm not what I'd like to be. But you can have a look and see the difference that Jesus has made so far. And alongside the mediocre reports in the surveys of what people achieve when they're followers of Jesus, there is one big plus that those who have faith live happier lives, which is worth recording. St. John of the Cross, who you may not have read recently, Spanish mystic from the 16th century, said followers of Jesus are to be windows through which the divine light enters the world. So, this is what Jesus is talking about. He is saying that you, by virtue of being a follower of Jesus, if you are a follower of Jesus, have within you the light of the world, which is his light of the world, and your natural state of being is that people will see that, and that will cause the people who are watching not to say, my goodness me, he's a rather fine fellow, she's a rather fine girl, but instead to say, Isn't God truly wonderful? So if our purpose is to be radiators of the light of Jesus, if we are not being those who radiate the life of Jesus, life is sad. 
uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones again. There is nothing in God's universe that is so utterly useless as a merely formal Christian. So my last section, comparatively briefly, is this. You are the light of the world. Words of Jesus to his first followers, words of Jesus to you. Uh, Paul writing in Ephesians, you were once darkness, now you are light in the Lord. And I hope you've been around following Jesus long enough to recognize that this is not dependent on how you feel. Um, this year at New Wine, I was there for two weeks, um, I, I had some, some quite significant health problems and I was in pain most days. And uh, I'm already highly qualified as a grumpy old man and I felt much more of a grumpy old man when I was there. But I got on with the stuff that had to be got on with. And, yeah, talk to people about Jesus. Two of them chose to follow him. Good stuff. I like my job. Um, but one person who came to the Just Looking meetings said to me uh, towards the end of the week when he was coming, he said, you know, when I watch you, what I admire most is your serenity. Well, I, I, was, I was chuffed, but I didn't expect it. Because... I knew what my feelings were, but he could see what it was that God was doing within me. So despite my inadequacy, he was able to see something that helped to draw him closer to Jesus. What does light do? It illumines. That's its job. If we are the light of the world... People will have light brought to their darkness. And, and the most important thing is this, that they will recognize that they are estranged from God. Light brings life. If Jesus' radiance shines through us, people will realize that they can know life in greater fullness than they already do. Light exposes things that might otherwise be hidden. And those who in us encounter the light of Jesus will see stuff that helps them to realize what will make them more like the person that God first wanted them to be. And light sometimes dazzles. So we need this light. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of my favorite theologians, I'm sure you read him on a daily basis, um, he was hanged uh, for opposing Hitler and admittedly an assassination attempt may not have been the best Christian uh, uh, way to go about it. Um, he, he had wonderful last words as they took him out to hang him in a concentration camp in 1945. He said, um, this is the end, for me the beginning of life. He's a great guy. And he wrote a book on Christian community in which he says this, flight into the invisible is a denial of the call. If we are hiding the light, it is a denial of our call. Why do we hide the light? Uh, sadly, um, there are reasons why we do. And, and as a pastor, I understand them. I just couldn't resist the graphic. Um, <laughs> we may hide the light because of a misguided feeling of inadequacy. I'm not going to tell people I'm a Christian because they'll see what a lousy Christian I am and they won't want to follow Jesus. Uh, this, like all the other things we're going to list, are lies. Uh, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Second one, embarrassment. Guess what? Another lie. Um, refusing to let people know that you follow Jesus because you're going to feel uncomfortable. Well, think about their best be. What about, this is a comparatively recent one, fears about employment. You do need to be wise when you talk about your faith but you can talk about your faith in any employment in the right way without causing a disciplinary problem to arise. If you insist on praying for somebody in a secular environment, then you will understandably get into trouble. But if you, at somebody else's invitation, talk about what works, it's good. So when I was teaching uh, philosophy and ethics at GCSE level, teaching a module on miracle, uh, I told some people in one of my classes miracles I'd seen. One of the year 11 boys said, all right, sir, get him to fix this. So his request, prayed for him. His wrist was 
Uh, well, all the symptoms immediately went. And he jumped up and knocked his desk over. And I said, how can my body do that? So if you do it the right way, you should not have fears of employment. Sometimes we fear rejection. And I can understand that. But let me tell the younger ones here. Yeah, back in the day, uh, when I first followed Jesus, you talked about faith and you were a Bible basher. In today's postmodern millennial generation, it's different. You have freedom to talk about what is important to you. As long as you don't insist that, that your answer will automatically fit their question, you have freedom. And fear of persecution, but not for us. Uh, some ways in which you can feed the flame and then we'll pray. You need to do anything that makes us more carriers of the divine. Now, I thought carefully about this. This means nurturing relationship with God. And we are, as a church, weighted towards relational and experiential. But not all of us fit into that box. So if you're somebody who can experience the presence of God and be aware of relationship with him, spend as much time as you can talking and listening and enjoying him. But for others amongst us, uh, nurture the spiritual disciplines. You may have a friend that you have a relationship with, but the relationship is hard. If you have any sense, you don't give up talking and you don't give up listening. And the spiritual disciplines of prayer, when you can't be aware of God hearing you, or of stillness, when you can't be aware of God speaking to you, are actually essential to maintain the Jesus presence in our lives. Living within community, and I, I love it here that every Thursday morning the staff get together and, and pray for an hour. Um, it is great. It strengthens me in following Jesus. I met this lovely guy a few weeks ago. He's the prior of a monastic community, even though he's so young. His name's Anders Litzel. And he's the prior of the new community of St. Anselm that Justin Welby has set up, where young people come and live a monastic life for a year at Lambeth Palace. And this coming year, I'm going to be acting as a mentor uh, for one or more of the, the young people who are there. But listening to them, I heard somebody say, as an evangelical Christian, they tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed to have a life of spiritual listening to God. When they went into community, with the support of those around them, it worked. Being prayed for, which is where we are. Um, sometimes people get more wound up about how they're going to respond than what they're going to respond to. Here are four questions I'd like to ask you. Have you chosen to follow Jesus? Chances are there are one or two people here who haven't. It may be that you have been reluctant to because you've thought it means you have to be good or because you think that Christians around you aren't as good as they should be. Let me tell you, that's not the heart of the message. The message is a welcome and an invitation to those who are broken and damaged to come back in relationship with God. Do you find it hard to believe that Jesus' light shines in you? Some of us will for different reasons. Have you been hiding your light? Are you aware that you have been putting your light under the metaphorical uh, measure of grain basket? Uh, does your flame need feeding? Can I ask you to take um, just a few seconds now? I know we're right up on time for collecting children. But can you ask in your heart which of those questions applies to you? Uh, or if there's another question that you need to respond to. Uh, and then uh, in a moment, if we have a tame musician, if we have a tame musician, a uh, tame musician or two, as the musicians play, we'll have a chance to pray with one another. And uh, you can respond to this with the person next to you. You can respond to this by coming to the front. We'd love to be able to pray with you. Um, whatever seems right to you. Father, by your spirit, help us to hear how you would like us to respond. In Jesus' name.